Hello, Jacksonites, and welcome back to another ranking video. As promised, as this was supposed to come last week. But no, someone wanted to delay me. I originally wanted to do this video on Shawnee Boy's channel and have both Shawnee Boy and my guest today be doing that video. But Shawnee Boy wanted to watch Godzilla vs. Kong twice. So just figure I'll do this with Trev. I just away. Today, me and good old Trevor Boy. Howdy, everybody. We'll be ranking the DC animated movie universe. Just rolls right off your tongue. Now, for those of you who don't know, the DC animated movie universe is a series of animated short movies that have been going on since 2013 and ended last year with Justice League Dark Apocalypse War. There's technically 16 movies in this continuity. I am discounting Constantine City of Demons because that one was more so retroactive to this continuity, even though it uses a very similar animation style. And I believe Constantine has the same voice actor uh, in City of Demons and Apocalypse War. But apparently there's not as much connective tissue between that movie and this main series. So that will not be included. So me and Trevor Boy will be ranking 15 movies. And a lot of them aren't that great. Well, I didn't, I didn't want to say that right off the bat. But whenever I was ranking them, I was thinking, yeah, I feel kind of meh on a lot of these. And I also watched them back in February and into early March. So this is whatever impressions I had based on one viewing a piece. So it, pretty it's similar for me. For I've seen a f only a few of these movies more than once, and the ones that I w I have seen more than once I'll mention. But a lot of these are first time viewing. And I'm just going to get this out of the way. I don't think any of these movies are amazing. Like, there's various levels of good. There's good, really good, great, and, you know, fantastic or stuff like that. Like, Godzilla vs. Kong is fantastic, whereas Shazam is just good. Um, the best that these movies get is just good. Um, there's one that gets really close to being really good, which I will mention. But none of these movies, I don't think, overly impressed me. Um, but a lot of these movies I do think are kind of crap, which I will, of course, explain as to why. But So this should be a really interesting series. Um, there's certainly a lot of movies in this series. And there's a lot of different movies in this series. So hopefully me and Trevor will have some nice and very different opinions on these movies. I guarantee you I'm going to have a, uh, one or two. Well, I'm definitely, I want to have more to say, but then again, you know, I couldn't just rewatch 15 movies right before the review. So I'm going to try and just go off of whatever impressions I had. And uh, I think our list will probably be fairly different. And, and I, I will say that, there's a good chance I'll probably like these movies more over time if I get to watch them a little bit more. But for now, yeah, I'm probably going to say that uh, there's definitely a lot of mess here. So, Trev, since you're my guest, you can start off first. All right. At the very bottom, number 15, and this is just based on how it held my interest, uh, Suicide Squad, Hell to Pay. It's not necessarily a bad movie. I actually like how it executes its R rating. Uh, but maybe I was just starting to kind of lose my interest in the series or it was starting to waver at this point. But I remember watching it and I just would kind of start doing some other things, which usually doesn't happen with me whenever I'm watching a movie or even a franchise. Um, but yeah, I, I do like, and Nick's probably not going to like this, I do like how it tied back into Flashpoint Paradox by bringing back uh, Reverse Flash. Um, the whole getting uh, getting uh, get out of free uh, getting out of hell free card thing was 
pretty silly, but definitely something you'd expect from a comic book. Um, yeah, again, I mean, I need, I need to watch it again, but I just remember this one didn't hold my interest as well as I was hoping it would. But again, it's like I said, uh, a lot of these movies are, uh, bound to grow on me as time goes on. I think I killed them, ladies and gentlemen. It's like I said, I've, I figured this one was actually probably higher on your list. Does anybody have a defibrillator? <laughs> That's one of a few of these movies that I really, really liked. Um, hey, it's like I might change my mind. But here, you, you tell me what, well, yours is going to be higher up then, isn't it? Uh-huh, like way higher. Okay, well, we'll get to that then. All right, so... so at the very bottom of the barrel for this series, this was one of few that I heard about before I really knew how many movies that were in this series. And actually it came out, like I heard of it the year that it came out, and I, I saw it, I thought it looked really interesting. And then I brought it home and watched it, and I was pissed. At number 15 comes Justice League Dark from 2017. I hated this movie. I was so miserably disappointed by this movie. You give us a badass front poster with Constantine, Zatanna, Dead Man, Batman, Etrigan the Demon, and Swamp Thing. A, Swamp Thing is barely fucking in this movie. And he gets his clock cleaned so easily in this movie. And then you just give us a really boring, slow, dull, uninteresting, uneventful tech demo. I don't find Etr I find Etrigan the Demon's rhyming to actually be extremely annoying. So that always drove me nuts whenever he was on screen. Um Batman, to me, stuck out like a sore thumb. Really, really... Well, no. Batman and the rest of the Justice League in general, to me, stuck out like a sore thumb. I just feel like they were thrown in here just to add a little bit more tension to the movie. Like, have Batman try to fight off the regular Justice League while Justice League Dark Team is taking on Dr. Destiny. Speaking of which... Dr. Destiny was a very uninteresting villain. He was just a typical evil warlock. whoop de doo um, Well, I will say, I did like the opening with Superman encountering the, uh, the possessed people. I thought that was kind of neat. That was probably the only sequence in this movie that I thought was okay. But outside of that, I just did not like this movie. I thought Justice League Dark was just a... Oh, another thing, too. I believe this was the first in the series to be R-rated. Did not deserve its R rating. I found it to be very, very tame. Very, very, very tame. I actually think Batman and Harley Quinn would have been a better candidate for an R rating because that one actually is... It's not violent, per se, but it's a lot more raunchy. This one, I just feel, was very, very tame. So, yeah. Yeah. I did not You're like right. Justice League Dark. I thought it was a big disappointment. I went into this with really high expectations, and I came out of it about to yank the hair out of my head. Yeah, I do believe you're right. Uh, all the movies before that one were, were PG-13. They were like a hard PG-13, but this is apparently the first one that went full R. You could have fooled me. This just looks like another regular... Hardcore PG-13 film. like Okay, Batman The Dark Knight Returns. That's another one that definitely should have been would have been a better candidate for an R rating. But this one gets it. Why? Because it's dark. <laughs> Continue. Yeah, so my number 14 is going to be uh, Justice League versus Teen Titans. And it's mainly because whenever I was making this ranking, nothing really stood out to me about this one compared to the Judas contract, except for the the scene at the fair. What what's the what's the that game 
called where you're trying to match the B? Dance Dance Revolution, pretty much. I, I remember thinking, this is going on a little bit too long for my taste. I remember thinking, yeah, this is just, just going on and on. But, um, yeah, other than that, there were other things that I didn't mind. This was where Damien became, uh, uh, was introduced to the Teen Titans. So that was a nice progression from the two Batman movies. Um, but, yeah, mainly the reason why this is so low is that I just couldn't remember a whole lot about it that really stood out to me, at least based on that one viewing that I saw. Minus, you know, like the scene I just described, which I felt went on too long. So, yeah, that's my number 14. My number 14 is Justice League, The Flashpoint Paradox. Didn't really dig this one, mostly due to the fucking butt-fuck ugly animation in this movie. Yeah, it was a little odd. The, the story itself, what, okay, I don't really like the whole fish out of water alternate timeline trope. It's fine in Back to the Future Part 2, because I'm pretty sure that was like the first time something like that was ever introduced in any, time, any kind of time travel media. Maybe Doctor Who did it, but I don't watch Doctor Who. Um, fuck, that's been around since the 60s, so they probably have done it a couple times. Um but other than Back to the Future Part 2, I just never really dug the fish out of water um, alternate bad version of a timeline trope. And here, it's really fucking mean-spirited. Like, Aquaman and Wonder Woman are bitter rivals. Um, Superman is a skinny, scrawny, um, looking like a zombie from Life Force looking dude. Um, Let's see. Batman is an evil, unlikable douchebag. Uh, let's and see. Also huh? And also Thomas and also Wayne. Tom the design for Cyborg is fucking terrible. Um, there's a couple decent action scenes in this movie. But other than that, I just really did not dig Flashpoint Paradox. It mostly had to do with just the God awful animation. It was so fucking terrible. And yet they also absolutely wasted Kevin Conroy. He's literally only in two scenes, and I'm pretty sure he has like four or five lines in the whole movie. Yeah, that's right. I almost forgot he was in it. And they also wasted Captain Adam, who whom is one of my favorite DC heroes and is one of and in my opinion, one of the most underrated DC uh superheroes. Um, yeah, I didn't dig this one. Although Meadow did get a big kick out of seeing Mira get her head cut off by Wonder Woman. <laughs> but yeah, I just didn't dig Flashpoint Paradox. Thought it was mean-spirited, a little boring, kind of slow. I don't like the alternate timeline trope. And the fucking animation in this movie is just abysmal. Gotcha. So, my number 13 is going to be Batman Bad Blood. So is mine. Yeah, so, did, yeah didn't good. dig this one. I, I thought it was kind of <sighs> unnecessary and pointless. Well, I do think I like it a little bit better than you, but there were some things that felt <clears throat> like they came out of left field. Like Talia al Ghul's uh, evil scheme in this movie. Well, at first that took me back, but then I thought about it and I realized she was brought back by the Lazarus Pit, so she's technically kind of crazy now. But no, what really threw me off was the fact that she cloned Damien. Yeah, where's that coming from? Yeah, and I was thinking, why don't you just make that Bane? Because I was thinking he gave off a Bane vibe. Very much so, yeah. In fact, that's who I thought he was. Um... And then the twist that he's a Damien clone came around. I was like, wait, what? This guy is totally Bane. Well, yeah, what, what gave it away or what made you realize it wasn't Bane unless they were doing their own version is the fact that his mask had like these, these small bat ears, almost bat ears. Yeah. So and I just remember, uh, 
this is the one where there's several different um, additions to the Bat family, right? Batwoman, whom her character feels totally forced and nothing's done with her for the rest of the series until she gets unceremoniously killed off in Apocalypse War. Yeah. Same uh, for Batwing. Batwing. Totally pointless. Yeah, well, I really liked uh, Lucius Fox in the Nolan movies, so I thought it was cool that there was some kind of story going on with him, even though this is his son. I, I like the design like the for game. Batwing. Don't get me wrong. I, I like the idea of a more a tech heavy version of Batman, who's pretty much like this version of Falcon from Marvel. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, I like the design and the idea. The, just the name is Batwing because you know the Batwing is actually one of Batman's vehicles, so it would be like. He probably should have a different name, but at the same time, I can't uh, think of what else he'd be called. But um, I actually did kind of like that whole idea of additional uh, bat people, quote unquote. But I just thought some of the, the the villain plot just felt totally random, random and comic booky, in not a good way. No, it, it felt a little too ridiculous and a little too simple and and it just didn't feel properly fleshed out this this felt another thing about this one too this felt really like a, a big filler episode um yeah i'd say that too it's just uh i mean i would still watch it there's things i did like about it the one thing I that i liked about it was the quick scene where we get to see Alfred actually be able to fight. Because we see him wield a shotgun in Batman versus Robin, and that was cool. And now we actually get to see Alfred is able to fight hand-to-hand. -hand. So I was like, oh, he actually can fight. Damn. I thought that was cool. And a couple of the action scenes were pretty good. Like Batwoman versus Talia at the end was a pretty good fight. But... Yeah, this one I just didn't really dig very much. It w it was a bit a bit too uninteresting. There's it also felt very much like it was trying to be a backdoor pilot for a Batwoman spin-off movie, but that never came yeah. to be. Yeah, I I'll just say that uh again, going through because I think I watched all four of the Batman movies in one sitting. Uh, it just felt really, it just felt really jarring compared to the first two. And that was my main takeaway from it. Mm -hmm. Oh, so. so, and also this is a Batman movie and Batman himself is not in the movie very much. So funny to think me being an anti Batman guy, it's funny to think that the one that doesn't have Batman in it very much is the one that suffers the most. Ironically enough. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my number 12 is actually going to be the last of the solo uh, Batman movies in this little series. Uh, Hush, Batman Hush. And it's not because it's a bad movie. I just, whenever I was ranking these, it just kind of kept on falling lower. And I think maybe the thing was that even though it's a pretty good adaptation, it changes some things here and there. I actually like the fact that Hush is the Riddler now because the comic book Hush isn't that great of a character in my opinion. Mm. So I thought it was interesting that they just decided to merge the Riddler and Hush characters instead of them being uh, in league with each other. I thought might as well just make it the Riddler. Um, but yeah, this is probably the most straightforward uh, adaptation of a comic book story out of all these movies, aside from, I guess, the the death and reign of Superman. Superman, sorry. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that's probably why it's lower for me, is that it's just a pretty almost straightforward adaptation of the story. It, it tweaks things to fit this continuity. But uh, yeah, it's pretty much what I expected, and uh, it didn't hold too many surprises. So I think that's probably why at this moment it's uh, it's number twelve for me. 
My number 12 is Justice League Throne of Atlantis. This one wasn't terrible, but the biggest thing for me is it just felt really pointless. I know it came before, but there's a lot of stuff seen in this movie that we see in Aquaman 2018. So yeah. this just felt really redundant. And the whole time I'm just feeling like anything that this movie gives me, there's a better version of it in Aquaman 2018. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, actually, I'll just point that out whenever I get to it on my ranking. But uh, there's a neat little tidbit that ties to something you like. Uh, what, the voice actor for Black Manta in this movie played Black Manta's dad in Aquaman 2018? Oh, no. Um, well, now that you mention it, it's actually Harry Lennox who played uh, Swanwick in Martian Manhunter in the live-action movies. But no, yeah, I'll just go in and tell you, uh, Matt Lanter, you know, uh, Anakin from Clone Wars, he was Aquaman. And... The guy who who played Star Killer in Force Unleashed One and Two played uh, Ocean Master. Yeah, Sam, Sam Witwer. He was also Darth Maul. That too. Yeah. So and this movie had. I think this is when the series started having really good voice acting. Um. As, as well, like it had a really good voice cast. I. It also introduces Superman and Wonder Woman becoming a thing, which I think is much more interesting than Superman and Lois Lane. Um, if I ever review Superman the animated series, I'll explain why I, I never like Superman and Lois Lane. But um, this movie had some good action scenes. Um, I liked this version of Mira more than the movie's version not because she would not just because this one's not played by amber turd but also because she's not nearly as what's bitchy. the word well not just bitchy like really highfalutin no what's, what's the word she's not as unlikable she's actually, she's actually not nearly as unlikable as she is in Aquaman 2018. Like for the first two thirds of that movie, she spends the whole time just insulting uh, Aquaman left and right. And it just gets a little old. So, well, I'll save that for when I review Aquaman, but their relationship in this movie, Aquaman and Mira, their relationship in this movie felt a lot more, no pun intended, fluid and genuine. Um, but this one, again, it wasn't necessarily bad. Um, of course, Samuel Whitware does a really good job as Ocean Master. This movie's biggest problem, though, it's not even really a problem, is that a better version of this movie exists, and that's Aquaman 2018. Um, this just feels like the blueprint and prototype of Aquaman 2018. So maybe I should actually say, from this point on, I don't think like I we already got through the bad movies. So from here for a while, these are movies that are good, but they just could be better. And Throne of Atlantis is the first of those. Um you see, yeah, Throne of Atlantis wasn't bad. And also, I know that it was supposed to introduce Aquaman, but Aquaman not is not really in it all that much. And he spends a good majority of the film kind of getting his ass kicked. But yeah, I think part of the problem um, is that the Justice League is also involved. That too, so, so it, it steals his thunder. Yeah, uh, I do. I do believe this was the first time that Rosario, Rosario Dawson uh, did the voice for Wonder Woman, and I actually couldn't tell at first. Because she has a real distinct voice, mm -hmm. and it didn't sound like her in this movie, but later on, especially by the Wonder Woman movie, you can definitely tell it's her. So I don't know if she was trying to do a different voice for this or not, but yeah, I was I was kind of surprised because I was listening. I was like, that doesn't sound like her, but then the credits popped up. I was like, oh, that was her. So the more you know. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Justice League Throne of Atlantis, it wasn't a bad film. It's 
a better version of this exists already, though. So this one just feels really uh, pointless to watch. I got you. Okay, so my number 11 is going to be the Judas Contract. I like this better than uh, Justice League versus Teen Titans. Um, I think really what kind of caught my attention with this was... Um, oh, crap. Oh, uh, Tara, that's her name. The story for Tara was very interesting to me. Her arc is ugly in this movie, was, though. Yeah, and she is definitely very bitchy, probably a little bit more than she needs to be, because if I remember right, it kind of bites her in the ass there at the end. Yes. But, uh, yeah, I like the way they used uh, Slade in this movie. Uh, Slade Wilson, a.k.a. Deathstroke, or vice versa. Um, Deathstroke, the Terminator. Um, yeah, this, this just uh, compared to its predecessor, this probably stuck out to me a little bit more. We we got more time with each of the characters, I think, uh, catching up with like their own individual stories. Um, the Brother Blood thing was kind of surprising to me because I remembered the Arrow version, uh, which is basically just a ripoff of Scarecrow from the Nolan Batman movies. Um, so this was, uh, I'm, I'm guessing this is more accurate to the comic books, and this uh, version of Brother Blood was a lot more intricate and... Uh, more There's threatening. A lot more too. What? More threatening. More threatening, and there was just a whole lot more to his uh, his cult and like the mythos that they were uh, dealing with. It was very, very intriguing for me. And uh, although it's a cliche, I mean, it, it's you know, it's a comic book thing. You're bound to run into a cliche at some point. Uh, the whole idea of siphoning all their powers and uh, becoming like a a conglomerate there at the end for a final boss. Or as um, uh, Channel Nerdgasm put it, he kind of turns into a diet amazo. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Super Scroll, if you wanted to. Go or that, that too, too, yeah. Um, but yeah, th there were just things about this that stuck out to me uh, and were more memorable, I guess you'd say, compared to the, the first uh, Teen Titans movie in this series. So yeah, that's why it's uh, that's why it's my number eleven. My number eleven. This is going to be the one that turns the most heads, because for some reason this one is just so highly regarded in this series. Sorry, Shiny Boy. My number eleven is Justice League Dark Apocalypse War. Okay. Ugh. Just breathe. <laughs> okay, so I didn't hate this movie. Didn't really enjoy watching a lot of it, though. Man, you're, you're not going to like my number four and five. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I knew that a whole lot of the DC superheroes in this series just get fucking annihilated in the in like the first 20 minutes of this movie. So I knew that going in, but actually sitting down to watch it, I mean, I felt like Aquaman. Like this series didn't really do Aquaman very well in my opinion. A fucking yeah, Aquaman kind of gets style. disemboweled and torn in half. Shazam gets a leg torn off. Batgirl gets torn to pieces. Bane gets torn to pieces. Batwoman gets torn to pieces. Black Manta gets ripped in half. Um, let's see. Harley Quinn, King Shark, and Captain Boomerang and Lois Lane get blown the fuck up. Lex Luthor gets impaled. Um, Green Lantern gets killed, I think, somehow. Mira, Martian Manhunter, Wonder Woman, and Starfire get turned into cybernetic freaks. Nightwing gets killed and brought back insane in a Lazarus pit. Like, the fucking filmmakers must have had some kind of angry, massive hate boner for the entire DC pantheon in this movie because fuck me. This just felt so evil 
angry and mean spirited. The first 20 minutes of this movie just makes me feel like utter dog shit and turns. I know they explain it later in the movie, but turns Constantine into the most unlikable prick douchebag of the entire series. Well, to be fair, he's like that anyway. So. Yeah, I know, which is why I've never liked Constantine, but damn. It, and it seemed like he was finally turning over a new leaf with Zatanna, but then he just immediately reverts back to his old ways into being an unlikable drunk douchebag. Um, I did like Etrigan the demon because he stopped rhyming. Literally, he just stopped rhyming. He just became a badass fire spewing demon. Um, he was depressed. That too. <laughs> um, I like some of the action scenes. Like the final fight with Superman and Trigon versus Darkseid was really good. Speaking of which... Um, Tony Todd does a phenomenal job voicing Darkseid, way better than Justice League War. I do like Justice League War, but uh, I'll save that for when I talk about that. But Tony Todd does a really good job as Darkseid. The animation is really, really solid. This is the only one of the whole series that actually does legitimately feel like a complete film um, because of its 90-minute runtime. And also... I do admire and respect how ballsy this movie was by being such a dark, depressing movie. I just don't really like dark, depressing movies. <sighs> so Justice League Dark Apocalypse War is not a bad movie. Damien's character growth was really good in this as well, too. Like He's definitely changed a lot from the... Um, assassination brat that he was back in Son of Batman. Um, and his relationship with Raven, I thought, was really well done. Um, and also, that's another thing, too. If you're a fan of Raven, this movie definitely gives her some time to shine. Um, and I did like that final scene where Trigon just says, be well, daughter. Um, or, like, something along those lines. I thought that was kind of sweet, even though Trigon's an evil douchebag. Um, It had its moments, but... Oh, and fucking Swamp Thing gets... Ugh. Of all the superheroes in this movie, aside from Martian Manhunter, Swamp Thing is the one that gets the most nerfed. Like, fuck. Hey, uh, what are those uh, Marvel movies that Darkseid uses to, like, uh, to terraform things? What are they called? Do you remember? I do not know. But I agree with Shawnee Boy. This movie really needs a part two. Because that's another thing, too. They kind of just leave it on a fuck you ending. Kind of like Gamera 3 or Shin Godzilla just leaves it with a fuck you cliffhanger ending. Um, and you all know how much I like those. Not at all. So, yeah, Justice League Dark Apocalypse War, I really don't see myself uh, revisiting this movie um, very much. There's some things about it that are good, but it's so mean-spirited and evil and angry. It was really off-putting for me. So, yeah, that's my number 11. No, I got you. Before I go to my 10, I, I was bringing up the dark side of... Uh terraforming engine thing because i like how even though he got beat i like how swamp thing kind of brought brought his all into it i like how he uh basically used the green to attack the engines i thought that was cool but i do think you're right overall he's kind of just kind of kind of a cameo in both of the movies that he pops in which is weird because so. you'd think with the entire earth at stake he would have stepped in to fight off the parademons a lot sooner than right at the last minute. Selfish true, bastard. True. <laughs> well, hey, I mean, Constantine was kind of scolding him for that. But yeah, I see your point. Um, all right, so cover your ears, Nick. Uh, this is my number 10. Now, I'm not going to say a whole lot about it because we've already talked to you about it a fair amount. 
Uh, my number 10 is Flashpoint Paradox. Mm. And the main reason, the main reason is because I've always liked the uh, Barry Allen, uh, Nora Allen storyline. <clears throat> That's always resonated to me. And I think that even though what's kind of frustrating about the movie is that they don't specifically say that reverse flash was the one who was responsible for her murder. Is this reverse um, flash or is this zoom? Well, I keep on calling it reverse flash because in the CW universe, which is the first time I saw him, uh, they made reverse flash and zoom two distinct characters. Cause and I think they are just dis two distinct characters. Actually. Yeah, they are. There's reverse flash and there's professor zoom yeah, or just zoom which is what's frustrating. Oh, okay. Like, Reverse Flash was what he was called with Barry Allen, I do believe, but the Wally West Flash... Uh, oh, his em nemesis is Zoom. This is Zoom. Yeah. I definitely like what they did with Zoom on the CW series, where they made him, like, this dark, uh, pitch black monster version of the Flash, and he was voiced by Tony Todd. I thought that was really cool. But... That, that's another conversation. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, mainly it's just the, the, the whole, really the source material, and I think they do it fairly well is why I like Flashpoint Paradox. It's also what this whole franchise sprung from. I think Nick brought up some good points about problems with it. The animation is kind of off-putting compared to the more streamlined, well, pretty much all the other movies after this had the same style. Though, again, you know, Meadow did get a big kick out of watching wow. Mira get her head cut off. And it's funny you were saying that Aquaman was pushed to the side because uh, he's either pushed to the side or he starts off uh, a major dick, which he is in this movie. Yes. But Until Aquaman decide. 2018, which makes him into a legit hero. Yeah, exactly. So the, all those things aside, this is number 10 for me, mostly because I just like the whole background story for The Flash. So, yeah. And I, I do think that, uh, as opposed to Nick, I actually do think some of the the alternate what happened if this happened kind of things are interesting. Uh, they only scratched the surface with the Thomas Wayne, uh, Martha Wayne, Joker, and Batman. Compared to the comic. Yeah, that's another thing too. Like that that's a an interesting turn of events. So again, I think it's a it's a problem with the fact that these movies aren't very long. They probably could be longer. Oh, and then, that that's a universal flaw that all of these movies have is that they're too fucking short. Notice I haven't been bringing that up. All of these movies are way too fucking short. But with these, just kind of seems like Warner Brothers is well, lately they've been doing movies that are over an hour and 20 minutes. So I'm a little bit more forgiving now. But a lot of these, like Batman Bad Blood, not counting its credits, it's like an hour and 10 minutes. Hmm. Yeah. But that's well, a universal that. issue that all of these movies have. Even Justice League Dark Apocalypse War, that one suffers from it the least because it's 90 minutes. But still... All of these movies, their biggest universal flaw is that they're so fucking short. Continue. Yeah, I don't know if it's just like a stigma of the animation genre or like a thing that they feel they have to, a stereotype that they have to fulfill. Or maybe it's just like a cost issue. But yeah, I agree. Um, Definitely would help if most of these movies were at least 90 minutes. But yeah, I mean, not much else to say. Uh, it's my number 10. So, your number 10. My number 10 is going to be Justice League versus Teen Titans. I didn't hate this one. I thought it was pretty entertaining. I did see Judas Contract first, so this felt like a step back even though it would have been a good progression if I watched Justice League versus Teen Titans, then Judas Contract, but I didn't. Um, yeah, I didn't hate this one. I do agree the Dance Dance Revolution scene goes on a little too long, 
it was funny and it was entertaining to, to watch Damien finally actually have to struggle at something, uh, but then put Beast Boy in his place. But I think the big issue with this movie is the team, the, the Justice League themselves feel totally pointless. And the actual fight between the Justice League and the Teen Titans is brief, uneventful, bland, and pointless. I think it's mainly a marquee value kind of thing, or like they feel mm -hmm. that since they've done at least a couple of Justice League movies already in this uh, franchise, uh, they figure that they're gonna if they're gonna introduce something new, it's kind of like a bridge. Kind of deal, maybe. But, well, I, I kind of agree with Shawnee Boy. Is um, this movie should have just been a Teen Titans movie? They could have called it Teen Titans: Wrath of Trigon. For all I care, it would have been if they just made this a, a well. They could have included the Justice League at the very beginning, like to to have that scene where Damian gets frustrated with being just like a a worthless Justice League. Movie. Member, but out after that, this should have just been a straight up solo Teen Titans movie, and I think it would have been much better. You would have had more time to, because that's another thing too. You don't really have time to get to know the Teen Titans team as much as you do it. Well, I'll talk about that later. Even in the original, because one of the biggest things I've I find very um, enthralling about the Teen Titans team is there's a lot of times where you get attached to the team. Well, they're a bit more relatable, too, because a whole there's a whole lot of teenagers that can watch the Teen Titans, and uh, that just makes them fun and entertaining to watch. Here, they just kind of felt like the most barest, bare-bones minimum of the, the Teen Titans dynamic here. And what we have is is decent, but I just feel like there could have been more done with it. And if they removed the Justice League, more could have been done with it, and this movie could have been better. But outside of that, what we do have is good. All the Raven stuff and Trigon stuff is really good. Uh, the Possessed Weather Wizard and Possessed Superman uh, is a really cool concept. Trigon himself, it, he has a badass design, and he definitely does come off as a threatening villain. Um, and their fight with Trigon and the Teen Titans is entertaining, um, especially when they enter hell pretty much and they're, they're trying to cover Raven so that she can trap Trigon yet again. Um, that's all entertaining stuff. Um, and I agree. Yeah. I, I wish they could have made a TV series out of this version of the teen Titans. I think that actually would have been better than the original teen Titans show. Um, yeah, definitely with this animation style too. Um, yeah, overall, this wasn't a bad movie. It had its moments where it was entertaining, but really it's the Justice League elements that bring this movie down for me. Yeah, it's funny. I actually forgot that this was the one where they went down into hell. It pretty much is hell, private. yeah. Because Trigon pretty much is like Marvel's, or not, uh, DC's version of Marvel's Mephistopheles, which is a Doctor Strange villain. Um, Trigon pretty much just is DC Satan. Yeah. And also Ghost Rider. Don't forget him. Oh, yeah, that too. So you're number nine. Yeah, but... Oh, but real quick, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, I think to solve your, your criticism with it, they could have just had Batman drop Damien off at the start, and then we don't see him again until they have to reunite in a later movie. But okay. yeah, anyway, so I'm actually going to say my uh, number nine and number eight at the same time because, as you told me, and I agree with you, I think they probably would have been better as one movie. Uh, my number nine and number eight are The Reign of Superman, or The Reign of the Superman, and Death of Superman. Really? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's the main thing I remember whenever we were talking about it, that... Um, yeah, this probably would have benefited from having these two stories just be one film. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, it, it definitely delivered on uh, the comic book elements that you're supposed to expect from the stories. And uh, 
But it, what I've noticed uh, with this franchise is that, sadly, none of the Superman stuff, and they actually, aside from these two movies, they don't do a whole lot with the character. Um, He's just their big gun. Just, uh, yeah. I mean, I like both of these movies, uh, but I've realized in watching some of the other animated DC stuff outside this franchise, like, for instance, uh, before it uh, left uh, Max uh, on Wednesday, I watched uh, Superman versus the Elite, which, aside from the animation and that, I mean, the style not being my cup of tea, the story was a lot more interesting, in my opinion. <coughs> or, even, or even stuff like uh, Man of Tomorrow. Uh, I think both of those that I just mentioned, those are actually more engaging Superman movies. And unfortunately, they're outside of the this franchise. But um, yeah, still, I, I still like these particular stories from the comics. That's why these movies are uh, about halfway for me on the ranking. So yeah, not much else to say. The main thing is that it probably would would have been better as just one movie. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So you're number nine. My number nine is going to be Batman Hush. Now, I heard that this movie did have a very controversial uh, splash when it hit the video market. Because I know that the Batman Hush storyline is a big fan favorite Batman story. Um, the thing is, I've never read the Batman Hush story. I knew of the changes going into this. Um, so... I went into this movie being a little cautious and I actually ended up enjoying it quite a bit. I thought it was a pretty decent Batman movie. And ironically, I think this is like the third or fourth from the last in this series. And this part or this movie was when finally Jason O'Mara finally started to grow on me as Batman. Cause I really don't think Jason O'Mara does a great job as Batman except for this and another Batman movie, which I'll talk about um, this and that other one. But here specifically, we get to finally see a different side of Batman other than just being the strict stern stick up your ass stick in the mud. Uh, like we finally get to see him actually give a damn about someone else. Well, Damien counts too, but you know, that's a given. That's his child. But we finally get to see him interact with someone that he actually cares about. We get to see a different side of Bruce and Batman other than just the vigilante. And I found that to be really refreshing. Not to mention the relationship between Batman and Catwoman I thought was actually really good and really engaging. And when she leaves him at the very end, I found that I, I thought that stung quite a bit. Um, yeah. The action scenes too are really, really entertaining. I do if you're a big Batman fan, there's a lot of references to various Batman villains that this movie has. Like you see Bane, Penguin, Mr. Freeze, Mad Hatter. Oh no, bad Mad Hatter, never mind. He was in uh Batman Bad Blood. Um just overall though, there's a lot of references to Batman lore in this movie. Now, the twist uh, at first that Hush is the Riddler instead of, what, Thomas Elliot? Was that his name? Yeah. At first, I thought it was kind of stupid. And while I do still think it, it does come out of nowhere, the, how they explain it in the context of the film, I thought was actually fairly well done. Um, because now that I, I kind of agree with Trev, I don't think Thomas Elliot was that interesting of a character. Didn't really have that much of an emotional connection. Well, not an emotional connection, but it was like a personal connection. Ha having it be Riddler, one of Batman's oldest foes, I thought made it a lot more refreshing. And for me personally, finally turned Riddler into an intimidating, threatening villain. Oh yeah, and Joker's in this movie too. For like half a second. Yeah, I just like the comic book story. And uh, I actually own uh, the whole that whole story art collected in two volumes. So again, like I was saying earlier, since this was so low on my list, unfortunately, 
I think the reason it was is because uh, I felt like there was something unique about all the other solo Batman movies in this franchise. And whenever I watched this movie, even though it's good, I kind of knew what to expect. So I wasn't quite as engaged as the the more fresher premises for the other movies were for me. But anyway, continue. Well, I have the opposite thing. I've never read this, the Batman Hush story, so I actually was pretty engaging with uh, engaged with this. Um, and also, this is just minor, but I actually liked Batman's suit in this movie more than the rest of the series. It was just more simple and streamlined, and I thought it looked... And I also love the dark shade of blue um, for Batman's cowl and his cape and his boots. I just liked it much better than his uh, regular one for the rest of the series. Um, looked more like classic Batman that I like. Well, that's also what he looks like in that storyline. And it's also a neat bit of trivia. Um, Jim Lee is... Uh, like the primary director, animation director for a lot of these movies. And, you know, he actually illustrated um, that story arc in the comic book. So the way they look in the in the comic, which was like from like the early 2000s, uh, they look pretty much the same in the movie because it's the same guy draw, drawing them. So that was neat. Yeah, Batman yeah. Hush, I think it's a pretty decent movie. It's got some good action scenes. And an entertaining, engaging story. Yeah, the t the twist that Riddler is Hush is very jarring, but I thought it was better done than most people give it credit for. So yeah, I like Batman Hush. You're number eight. I Son of Batman. Batman. Now from oh, here wow. on out, these are movies that I liked. Uh, well, Batman Hush I like too, but from here on out... There's nothing really bad that I have to say about these movies. Um, there's just maybe a couple things that I could talk about that could have been done better. But other than that, the rest of the list from here on out are all movies that I liked. And that the first of which being Son of Batman. I didn't really dig this one nearly as much the first time that I watched it. But upon a second viewing, especially when I was starting to really get into this series... I I dug this one a lot more. I like the story. I like the uh, introduction of uh, Damian Wayne. I thought it was really good. Though, yeah, he was pretty much a date rape conception. Which wasn't cool at all. Uh, but in the dynamic between Batman and Damian, I thought it was really good. It, obviously, it, it's, it's fun to watch... Bruce Wayne kind of squirm and be outside of his comfort zone with kids because he never came off as being a very kid-friendly guy, um, even though he probably raised like three or four kids throughout his entire career. Um, the action scenes were really, really good. The inclusion of all the man bats I thought was really cool. It was nice to see Batman go up against something other than just an armed thug. And also Killer Crocs in this movie, too. So I thought that was cool. Um, the actions... Uh, I already talked about that. But uh, the opening action scene at, at the League of Assassins headquarters... Um, oh, I guess Damien was a child of consent. But in this series, he's not. Um, anyway... Yeah, the opening action scene at the headquarters of the League of Assassins is probably the best scene in the movie. You just see ninjas and assassins tearing each other to pieces. The voice actor for Deathstroke kind of sucks in this movie. Like I like the I liked Miguel Ferrer or Ferrier uh, a lot better in Judas Contract. He's more gruff and deep and sounds like an older guy. Here, he just sounds like a regular Joe Schmo. Um, and it doesn't really, really fit all that well. Um, but yeah, I like this movie. I thought it was pretty entertaining. It was a lot of fun to, uh, to sit back and watch. Its sole problem is that it's too damn short. Arguably, you could combine it possibly with Batman versus Robin. Although their plots are pretty unique. So. Yeah, I still say that... 
Agreed. Yeah, but still, um, you, it would be a little bit more jarring for these two, but I still say that Batman versus Robin and Son of Batman should be edited together in one movie. But I'll talk about Batman versus Robin pretty soon. Yeah, so uh, my number seven is uh, Justice League War. So is mine. Okay, yeah, so let's just talk about it together. Go ahead. I have to change something real quick. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, I think Zack Snyder's Justice League is a better Justice League movie overall. But it is fun to see a very Avengers type of uh, variation of how they meet. Basically, the Superman, Batman, Green Lantern fight is like the Captain America, Iron Man, Thor fight in the first Avengers movie. I think that's what it was inspired by, or something to that effect. Um, this was this was based on the new Fifty Two reboot. I mean, I think actually all the movies are based on. Yeah, all these movies are loosely based on the new Fifty Two reboot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, not much else to say. That definitely, again, uh, Cyborg. Ironically, just like the the Zack Snyder Justice League movie, Cyborg gets a particular focus because we actually get to see his origin in this movie too uh, and he has a nice connection with Shazam a much more truncated version of his origin but yeah it's still good yeah it's just interesting to compare them although uh, curiously enough we get a sample a sample quote unquote of dark side uh, right off the bat since this is the only the second movie in the franchise and it establishes, even though he's done better for sure in later movies, um, he's uh, yeah. It, it's still it's still good to introduce him and show that he's no joke. Even if uh, there's better voice actors down the line and again more interesting plots, uh, still it's uh, it's interesting to just you know throw him out there. Wait, wait. You go ahead and elaborate, Nick. And I'll Justice I'll League War. Um, so real quick, I want to say that the, the biggest inspiration for doing this video is, uh, channel nerdgasm. He did this video way back in 2020 when, uh, justice league, dark apocalypse war was fresh, but I've rewatched that video a few times. And now that I've seen all of these movies, uh, it just, it inspired me to do this one. Justice league war was number 14 on his list. So that really stuck out to me as like, oh, wow, really? This one is so low. So I went into this one a, a bit cautious as well. I came out of it enjoying it quite a bit. It is rushed. It's way too short, which is the biggest issue that I have. Um, oh, and this isn't a flaw per se, but so I consider this to be the actual start of the DC animated movie universe. Yes, there's elements in Flashpoint Paradox that are referenced later in this series, but it's way later in this series for one thing. And also the designs really don't coalesce with Flashpoint Paradox in this one. So I considered this to be the real start of this series, and I do think it's a very, very good start. The biggest problem that I have with Justice League War is Darkseid himself. As a badass threat, he's fine, but it's his voice and just his demeanor and persona that is not executed very well. He looks and sounds like a giant robot. Yeah. Straight up, just looks like a giant robot. He walks like one, moves like one, and even talks like a giant robot. And for me, that this felt like a very phoned-in, lazy portrayal of Darkseid. The the voice is really the one that kills it. It's really gravelly and gutturally, and it doesn't really sound like a natural voice. And maybe they did it to make it sound make Dark Side sound otherworldly, kind of like with Swamp Thing and the Swamp in the original Swamp Thing TV series. But there kind of worked. But here, 
it just stuck out like a sore thumb, and it made Darkseid look not like an alien, but a robot. Um, all the action scenes are really, really good. The animation is really solid. Wonder Woman is really cringy in some moments. Like, this chef of ice cream is glorious. I know that was the point. It was kind of like a diet version. Uh, well, no, this came before tw Wonder Woman 2017, but but still, it, it, I know it's like the Wonder Woman being a fish out of water stuff. Um, but uh, Wonder Woman's badass in this movie. The um, dynamic between Batman, Green Lantern, and Superman is really, really funny and really entertaining. Was yeah, Nathan Fillion yeah. in this one? I think so. I, I think, think he, he was. was uh, there might have been one exception, but I think he was him in all his appearances. And I actually, I actually really liked, uh, particularly his dynamic with Batman. That was pretty funny. Yeah, his dynamic with Batman was hilarious. Um, yeah, I do think the weakest member of the Justice League is Batman, because, like I said, e every time. Batman shouldn't really not be a member of the Justice League, in my opinion. Um, uh, he always feels like the one that... Oh, it wasn't Nathan Fillion in Justice League War. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, Batman, to me, will always be the biggest example of a stick-in-the-mud character, uh, especially with the Justice League. He does not belong here, in my opinion. Every other member of the Justice League has some kind of superhuman ability. Then you just have Batman, who's the boring human. Like, why do you insist on having Batman in the fucking Justice League? Just leave him out of it. You should have brought in Martian Manhunter. Because he shows up in two or three other movies later in the series, and then they never explain where he came from. Like, where did Martian Manhunter come from? Yeah, it's like where, where the where the hell did he come from? Um, it was Justin Kirk apparently who did the voice of Green Lantern in this movie, but no. Oh um, yeah, it was it, it was Justin Kirk. Yeah, I just looked it up. Um, but no, I think mainly the reason why Batman still is part of the Justice League is because he's been there since the beginning in the comic books. He's one of the, the founding characters for the old DC Comics company. Uh, so I think that's probably one reason why he still hangs around, even if there's uh, potentially much better characters that could go in there. Like Martian really, Manhunter. Can... Yeah, exactly. But that could happen anyway, because the roster, uh, kind of like the Avengers, the roster usually changes from time to time. But yeah, I like Justice League War. It's a really, really good, solid start. Trips and stumbles with Darkseid, but the fight scenes with him are still very entertaining. The animation is really solid. All the characters are good and well flushed out and fun, especially Cyborg. Um, yeah, I like Justice League War, and it's one of the few. Uh, well, not really few, but it's one of the one of these movies that I actually do own on disc. So next, ow, number six. You can go ahead, Trev. Yeah, so my number six uh, is actually going to be the direct sequel to this movie, Throne of Atlantis. Although, uh, although you made a pretty good case for its problems, uh, the main reason it's uh, so high up here is because I, I just really like Aquaman. I do think that they could have done more, <clears throat> excuse me, they could have done more, the movie should have been longer, uh, but what I do find interesting is that it shows that even though this movie shares the same plot with the Aquaman live action movie, Justice League level threat, uh, what Orm is trying to do, uh, you know, take over the oceans and whatnot and threatening the surface, so I think that's probably why uh, even though I do think Aquaman, the live action movie, is more a Philly movie overall, I do like the whole aspect of including the Justice League because, again, I feel the threat level is something that they need to be present for. And plus, it's it's just fun. It's Fair just point. fun seeing. Uh, it's just fun seeing, you know, a lot of the same ground covered 
because Aquaman is one of my favorite uh, DCU movies. So if I see something that reminds me of it, it's gonna it's gonna connect with me. And uh, yeah, I just thought it's uh, it's just it's, it's a good sequel to War in my opinion, but it's just a little bit better than War in my opinion. So yeah, that's why it's my it's probably why it's my number six. My number six is Teen Titans, the Judas Contract. Um, this is definitely the one of the whole series I've rewatched the most uh, because this was one of very few movies in this series that I was really, really interested in. Back when I did my original superhero binge series, this was one that I really wanted to check out because it was longer than an hour and 15 minutes. So that to me just stuck out as it being, oh, wow, this might actually be able to be a legit movie. Um, yeah, I was right. I really don't have any major grievances with this movie. Um, like, this is definitely when my my complaints are very, very minimal for the rest of the series. Um, Tara is an unlikable bitch, but she always has been. Um, the voice actor for Slade is a lot better than it was in, Bat in Son of Batman. Um, I do wish there was a bit more of the teen di team dynamic in this film, but it was still really, really solid. And it just makes me want a TV series based on this version of the Teen Titans. Um, the humor is really good. Uh, like one of my favorite moments is when Nightwing and Starfire were sparring and she said, you lasted much longer this time. Oh, but not usually. He lasts much longer whenever we have set Corey. That <laughs> whenever I hear that, I just immediately start cracking up. Um, that was good. <laughs> it's funny, aren't I always? Um, yeah, I don't really have. Well, okay, I do think Brother Blood is a bit of a, like kind of a bit of a boring villain. I like the concept of him siphoning all their abilities and that pretty much just becoming a diet amazo, but it kind of just, it, this one kind of feels like it couldn't figure out if it wanted Slade to be the main villain again, or if it wanted brother blood to be the main villain. And I don't think it really, I don't think it balanced the two villains all that well, but other than that, I think this is a really solid movie. Oh, and a lot much better beast boy action in this movie than there was in, Justice League versus Teen Titans. Of all the Teen Titans members in in uh, in Justice League versus Teen Titans, Beast Boy was the one that I think was the most wasted. Um, because he's the comedic relief of the of the team. You got to have more Beast Boy action, and this movie definitely uh fulfills that a lot better. Well, and he also is featured a bit more prominently because he's crushing on Terra. Sadly. Yeah. <laughs> You're number five. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, he needs to have better taste. But anyway, uh, my number five, and you're not going to like this, but I'm not going to dwell on it too too long. My number five is Apocalypse War. Ugh. Now, you made a lot of very good points. It is a pretty uh, heavy movie, for lack of a better word. Um, I don't know. I just, uh, whenever it was really good, I thought it was really good. Sure, there's, again, like you said, we like Swamp Thing. Uh, they could, they definitely needed to use him more. Uh, the fates of the characters, uh, yeah, it's very, it's very depressing. Uh, well, all I'll say about that is, we better if we get a Justice League two from Zack Snyder, prepare to see something similar to that. But at least there will be a follow up to rectify it, unlike in this case. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just like the way this, uh, I guess, brings a lot of the different storylines to a to a head. Not necessarily a conclusion, although some do conclude. Uh, I don't know, man. It's just really that Trigon versus uh, Dark Side fight at the end that just uh, just really uh, pushes my buttons. So we're not not pushes my buttons. It's a. Uh, I, re I really like it. I'll just say that. <laughs> um, I like the fact that. Uh, you mentioned that Damien and Raven's relationship continues to uh, 
Blossom. Evolve or uh, yeah, Blossom. Uh, I also like the fact that uh, Superman and Raven kind of found each other after everybody else was dead. Yeah, that was uh, that scene. Um, I thought, even though it was like really sad and fucked up, I thought it was really sweet too. Like, it's it's a strange pairing. You don't think Superman and Raven, but they made it work, and I, I thought that was a really like she's about to kill her. For those who don't know, she's about to kill herself by like stabbing herself with a piece of jagged pipe. Then someone stops her, and she looks up. It's a Kryptonian ink riddled Superman. And like he just puts her hand on her shoulder and gives her a sad smile. Then she just immediately bursts into tears and he just like bends down and becomes either like an older brother or like a father to her. I found that to be really sweet. Um, yeah, that, that's something that immediately stuck out to me and kind of to a degree made up for the major ass whooping that everybody got uh, just a few minutes earlier, at least in that. Because that was a flashback, right? Whenever they showed that. Yes. Yeah. So in that present, uh, basically they had just been annihilated right before that moment happened. Ugh. Uh, but yeah. I, Damn. I, I like that. <laughs> I like that pairing, and again, it's a sweet moment because uh, the pairing you don't expect it, and it's very in character for Superman to do something like that. Yes. Because <laughs> there, there's actually a very similar moment from I don't know that exact story but uh yeah there's another moment like that where he prevents somebody from committing suicide that's uh yeah just very very in character for superman it again it makes him likable mm -hmm. um but yeah again i'm not gonna say too much I, I don't know i just felt like uh as a conclusion more or less for this particular franchise i felt i felt like it fit and again, I, I do agree. It, it's it's definitely something you have to be in the right mood for if if you ever are in the right mood, if at all. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, but still, it, it's kind of funny because uh, you don't like Flashpoint Paradox or this one, but they're also the beginning and end for the franchise too, which is which yep. is an interesting little thing. Um, and I don't necessarily think the end is necessarily sad because Barry's going to fix how that timeline went. So I would actually be kind of happy to say good riddance to how everything went down. Because, so, you know, Justice League War is the start of yet another timeline from the end of Paradox. And unfortunately, it ended up pretty shit but that's because dark side showed it right off the bat and this was the logical conclusion for that it would seem so uh my head canon i'm just gonna say this is my head canon for dc movies from here on out animated ones uh i'm gonna think of them as the start of the new timeline that barry initiated like man of tomorrow i don't think that yeah and in fact, even that movie could work as the origin for the Superman we see uh, in this franchise. It's very uh, open for interpretation. But yeah, not much else to say. I mean, I was just, uh, I was happy with what I saw if this had to end. So yeah, that's why it's my number five. Happy over. Oh, and you know, it's fucked up still, but um, Apocalypse War does take advantage of its R rating very, very well. Yeah, and again, I think aside from Constantine being fairly present, uh, that's another reason why they put the the Justice League Dark title in there because it could have just been Justice League Apocalypse War. But I digress. My number five is Batman versus Robin. I really dug this one. I went into this movie again really expecting just another Son of Batman. Like eh, it's it's decent, it's too damn short. But I remember the first time I watched this, I remember thinking, oh, this actually feels more like a complete movie. It's only an hour and 20 minutes. Damn. They did it very, they did it very well. And I mentioned that in my original review with Shawnee Boy um, when he was on his lunch break, which I'm pretty sure I made him 20 minutes late to work. Um, oops. Oh, well. Um, the action scenes in this movie are really, really, really solid. Probably my favorite, aside from the Wayne Manor fight, which is really, really solid, 
is Batman's first fight with the owls, with like the undead owls. Even though Batman gets fucked the fuck up, he still fucks them the fuck up too. Though I have to question, why wasn't Batman's suit equipped with body armor? Equipped with body armor? Like, why wasn't... That's one thing I really liked about the Batman Arkham Knight series is that his his bat suit clearly has armor on it. It may not be metal, but it's still... It's going to stop blades and bullets. This bat suit just looks like it's made out of tough cloth. But whatever. The fight scenes are really good. The story I thought was really solid. The Court of Owls stuff I thought was really, really, really well thought out. And I agree with Channel Nerdgasm. I think in terms of Batman content, the Court of Owls concept is some of the best stuff to come out in the last 10 years. Um, Batman's fight with Talon at the end is really, really, really good. Um, It's just very satisfying at first to see Batman just whip the living shit out of Talon, but once Talon pulls out the blades, that's when he takes down Batman. And then he gives birth to one of my favorite Batman quotes in the whole in all of Batman history. You and the court tried to take my city away from me, destroy my home, and messed of all. Or bleh, and worst of all, you messed with my kid. So this is gonna hurt, and I'm gonna enjoy it. Love it. Um, oh, and also you get to see fucking Alfred pull out a shotgun and start gunning down owl zombies. Good stuff. Batman versus Robin's a solid flick. Oh, and it actually does deliver on an actual fight between Batman and Robin. Unlike Teen Titans versus Justice League, where there, um, the fight just felt very forced and truncated. Here, they're button heads for a good majority of the movie until it finally comes to a head with them having a fight. Unlike in Teen Titans vs. Justice League, where it just felt forced and thrown in at the last minute. Yeah. You're number four. Hey, uh, more on uh, Batman vs. Robin in a little bit. But, um, yeah, my number four, and again, you're not going to like the stick, but I'm not going to dwell on it too long. My number four was Justice League Dark. And that's because I like what I saw. It does come up short. Again, it's a length problem. It's the fact that these movies just aren't long enough to like completely develop all their ideas. Also, not enough Swamp Thing. We always need more Swamp Thing. Of course. But I think the main reason why this is so high up, at least as of this ranking, again, all of these are subject to change with more viewings. Uh, the reason why this is so high up there is because even though it's not included in our ranking, I actually think that City of Demons is the best movie in this franchise. But that's because it filled my quota of really good demon monsters. Mm. And that, and also the story, although kind of fucked up, was very well told. So yeah, we're not including it on this list, but if we were, it would be by number one. And Justice League Dark kind of set the stage for that to an extent. The plot itself for this movie could have been better, just as Nick elaborated on a little while ago. Uh, but yeah, that's why it's higher up for me, again, as of this rating, because uh, it does lead into City of Demons fairly well. So yeah, not much to say about it than that. Hmm. My number four is Wonder Woman Bloodlines. For some reason, this was the one that I was like having a lot of trepidation about getting into. But I went into it and I found myself being really entertained. This felt... I've never really seen a whole episode of the show. But this felt like the classic 70s Wonder Woman show. It wasn't necess- It wasn't too dark. It was very fantastical, which is something that, uh, which is something I like about Wonder Woman because you know technically Wonder Woman's a god and she deals with Greek gods and such. So this felt a lot more fantastical and whimsical and a bit more not necessarily like a fairy tale, but okay, like a, a classic Greek myth. Um, and it deals with some Greek mythology because Wonder Woman is the big bad. 
or not Wonder Woman. Medusa is the big bad in this. The action scenes are really solid. The voice acting is great. Um, the fight scenes are awesome. The story I thought was pretty good. Um, the one major issue that I do have with this, is, though, is Dr. Poison and Dr. Psy Psylocke or Psyche. What, what was her name again? Uh, I don't remember. Hold that thought. Um, the two other villains oh. felt um, kind of pointless because they get killed off as soon as Medusa shows up and they just felt like, really? That's what you were building up to this whole time? Oh, Medusa? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to gush on that fairly soon. Uh, but I did think Medusa was done really, really well in this movie. And seeing Wonder Woman intentionally blind herself just to give herself an edge over Medusa, I was like, damn. That's some... Yeah, because... This was R rated too, right? No, this was PG thirteen. It was a, it was definitely of a more intense PG thirteen. Okay, because I was thinking like a moment like that, or uh, well, it was just implied nudity. Um, I thought stuff like that would have leaned into an R rating, but yeah, I guess that was a hard PG thirteen. Um, I'm not finding the I'm not finding the character's name right off the bat, but yeah. I, Oh, Dr. Cyber. Dr. Cyber, Cyber, that was it. Yeah, the, the Dr. Poison and Dr. Cyber felt totally superfluous. They, well, it didn't really need to be two. It could have just been Dr. Cyber. Like, I don't know why Dr. Poison had to be here, but I guess because Wonder Woman 2017 was a thing, and this was supposed to be a side piece along with Bloodlines when – or that, oh, fuck – this was supposed to be a side piece along with Wonder Woman 84, which is, was supposed to come out the same year, but it didn't. Um, so uh, I feel like the filmmakers threw in Dr. Poison as a familiar carryover from Wonder Woman 2017, but whatever. Yeah, I feel like she was – it easily could have just been Dr. Cyber. Dr. Poison just felt really pointless. But other than that, Wonder Woman Bloodlines, I thought was a really, really, really solid movie. It's very entertaining. Uh, the voice acting is good. The animation is good. And one thing I'll say, I'm so glad they brought back the gold and blue and red suit for Wonder Woman. I never dug the blue and red and silver suit. It looked too much like Superman. I never dug that yeah. design, so I'm glad that they brought back the the gold, red, and blue suit for Wonder Woman in this movie. Although for your uh, for your uh, your fan favorite ship, um, I guess the fact that they're having similar colors on their outfit wouldn't hurt. True, but Wonder still. Woman, Superman. <laughs> yeah. All right. So my number three. Go ahead. That's where we're at. Yeah. So my number three, sorry, I'm having to charge my phone. That's why I'm looking over who I am. Anyway, uh, my number three is Son of Batman. Mm. Uh, and again, I think uh, we've already stated that it would have been probably better if it was combined with, <clears throat> excuse me, combined with versus Robin as one movie. But uh, this still sets the stage for everything that we see later on with Batman pretty well. I've always been a sucker for the, the League of Shadows or the League of Assassins. League of Assassins, yeah. I think that's the more uh, common title. Yeah, well, and uh, the reason I said Shadows is because, well, I got into them because of Batman Begins, which is still my favorite Nolan movie of those three. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, but Ra uh, Ray Shal Ghul or Ra's Al Ghul. There's, uh, it's Raish. Ray Shal Ghul. Yeah, Raish. Well, you know, if we talk to no Oh, another that, thing, too. Teen, uh, Justice League versus Teen Titans. Ra's al Ghul comes literally out of butt fuck nowhere. Uh, yeah, he, he's either, uh, he's like a vision or he's like, he's, he's dead. He's dead. I can't, yeah, it's in hell or their version of hell, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I need to watch that again because it's, yeah. You keep on saying these different parts. I'm like, oh, that's where that was from. Okay. Um, but, but Son yeah, of Batman. Son of Batman I, yeah, I think uh, 
I think Batman versus Robin is better, as I will elaborate on here in a second. But this does set the stage well, I feel, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a good introduction to uh, Damian Wayne. He's an insufferable little snot, but he uh, he gets better as time goes on. Thankfully, I like Without- Alfred's quote. He's been out there since four in the morning. I'm rooting for the shrubs. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's, you know, uh, even in uh, Bad Blood to an extent, it's always great just seeing how the Bat family interacts with each other. Mm-hmm. At least in my opinion, the dialogue. You can tell that they've, even though Damien's like the new uh, the new recruit or the new addition, you can tell everybody else has known each other for a long time. Mm-hmm. So they have the rapport. So yeah, anyway, my number three is Son of Batman. And I will get into the, the Superior movie here in a second, but you're number two. Is it my number two? No, three. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Excuse my me. number three is Suicide Squad Hell to Pay. This was, aside from Apocalypse War, the biggest one that I was having trepidations about getting into. And I remember 15 minutes into... Oh, no, it wasn't even 15 minutes. It was just the, the pre-credit sequence. I texted the group Kaiju Squad chat. I was like, where the fuck has this movie been all my life? This is the biggest example of all of the... There's only three, I think. Three of these movies that are R-rated. This one definitely takes the best advantage of its R rating. It's bloody. It's violent. It's... um gory it's raunchy hell you see a, a a nip slip at one point um and there's two man-hating uh uh female supervillains in this movie that bump uglies um yeah it's violent it's gory it's bloody it's fucked up it's a goddamn suicide squad movie and it's very very entertaining it's also like, if you're going to have a Suicide Squad movie and it's going to be R-rated violent, which thankfully it seems like the new The Suicide Squad movie is going to be this way as well, it needs to be over-the-top and ridiculous violent. Because then it's just fun. Here, it's very fun. My sole problem with this movie... Well, I have two problems. One... I feel like the main villain should have just been kept as the caveman dude. Because yeah. Reverse Flash just feels forced in this movie. Well, yeah, and he's also, he's almost just like a reminder that, oh yeah, this franchise technically started with Paradox. That's he, what it feels like. Yeah, and I feel like he's the only thing that connects the rest of these movies to Flashpoint Paradox. You remove him, this series is completely standalone. Um. But yeah, I feel like he should not have been the main villain. The caveman dude should have been. And also, why did you kill off Copperhead? What the fuck? Yeah, he was my favorite too. He looked real cool. Yeah, and I I, I kept wondering, for some reason, can he talk normally? Okay, he can talk normally. He just somehow he has a, a British accent with c- cybernetic snake fangs in his mouth. Um, I wish he had more dialogue, and I wish he had more scenes in this movie, because he was my favorite too. And he gets unceremoniously killed off. Like, what the fuck, guys? Yeah. Other than that, um, Suicide Squad: Hell to Pay was entertaining as fuck. Definitely would watch this again. Yeah, I need to give it another shot. Uh, I guess whenever I watched it, I was just starting to kind of phase out of this particular series. But I mean. Yeah, there's still some good stuff in there, and I yeah needs a reevaluation. So my number two. Yep. My number two is Batman versus Robin. Ooh, okay. The superior sequel, the superior sequel to Son of Batman. Uh, really, I think what it is is I just really like the subplot with uh, the Court of Owls and uh, and the the kind of uh, not a dichot- dichotomy, but kind of the foil the character foil that Talon has with uh, Damien is very mm-hmm. interesting. I also like the kind of tug of war that Talon is having between uh, Batman over 
uh, yeah. take me in soul, so to speak. It's not that hardcore, but they're basically trying. They're you know, one's a surrogate father and one's his actual father. There's one is the de- one is the devil and one is the angel on each of Damien's shoulders. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I, I just I've always, even though they're a relatively new concept, I've always found the Court of Owls pretty interesting because it's a, it's a it's a nice introspection for Batman because he realizes, oh crap, I missed this. This has been under my nose this whole time, and I'm supposed to be the world's greatest detective. Mm. So, yep. you know, it's, it's pretty funny. Uh, Talon, he's a real interesting looking character. I, mm-hmm. I don't know if he's from the comic books at all, but I would like to see a lot more of him. Just, just the idea of this this owl themed ninja is just a really striking image, in my opinion. And also, uh, uh, in real life, owls are actually predators of bats. Exactly. And that, there's just, uh, see, I don't know. I think Scott Snyder. Uh, he created the Court of Owls. I don't know if he's kind of get uh, got into that in the books or not. Who yeah, is Scott Snyder? Mentioned. Zach's brother? No, they're not related, actually. But uh, oh, Scott's uh, he's a comic book uh, either writer or illustrator. I think he's a writer, not an illustrator. But or both. No relation. But, yeah, but he's. Uh, I do believe he was the creator of the Court of Owls. Ooh. And maybe he might, he might have been the one who made uh, uh, Dick Grayson Batman at one point for Batman Incorporated. Uh, uh, don't quote me on that. I'm not too sure. But eventually Dick did take on the mantle for a little bit, which he does in uh, Bad Blood. Is that the one where he Yeah, which Grayson? goes nowhere. Yeah, sadly. But I think it was a reference to that particular comic art. But yeah, uh, Batman versus Robin. Also, the start of this movie is a really great uh, little side mission for Batman and Robin to go on. And pretty disturbing, because I do believe it's Professor Pig that they that they see at the start. Yes. They, they go to the factory and they, uh, they basically find out, uh, find his dirty work. The skeleton and I did awesome. like that scene where like Batman is trying to open up to Damien and say, Hey, let's watch a movie together. I thought that was kind of yeah, sweet. Go ahead. I thought, I just thought that was kind of sweet, which I'm sure yeah. th- I'm sure there are fathers out there that struggle with fatherhood who can relate to that when they're, they're trying to have moments where they're trying to reach out and open up to their children. Well, especially if your kid is Damien, I mean, well, Fortnite aside from that, yeah, but no, I see, I see your point. Um, and again, I'm glad you brought that up because, again, I've only seen each of these movies once. Sometimes I forget uh, which which scenes go to which. So I actually did like that moment too with uh, watching the movie. But yeah, this is pretty far up there for me. This uh, definitely, obviously, is my favorite of the the Batman titles in this series. Uh, yeah, it just really, uh, really resonated with me and the, the concepts the action i mean you got into that nick talking about it um yeah i would actually go out on a limb and say this is probably one of the best uh batman movies overall so yeah i'd agree with that two. yeah so i'm gonna talk about my number two and one at the same time because they go into each other like how uh trev talked about them Number two is the reign of the Superman, and number one is the death of Superman. Reign of, there's nothing wrong with these movies. I just did prefer the death of Superman over Reign for one main thing. The death of Super, the death of Superman, a of course includes Doomsday, but the whole movie is just one big long action scene that has a few moments yeah. where it takes a break. Uh, just to catch up on the story and also build some mystery and suspense. But other than that, the whole movie is just full of action. Now, Reign of Superman, A, takes advantage of its longer runtime. B, has a bit more of a complex story. C, has more fan-favorite Superman characters, being Cyborg Superman and Superboy, which he gets fucking nerfed in Apocalypse War 2. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah. 
Um, um, eradicator. And, uh, yeah, Eradicator, too, which he wasn't originally just like a a hologram character in the original story. I think he was a separate entity that tried to take up the mantle of – because in the original – I have read the Death of Superman storyline. There he was called the last son of Krypton because like, there's four separate individuals that take up the title of Superman. There's – well, not counting Supergirl. She was there, too. There was, of course, Superboy. Steel, which they introduced They introduced Steel, I believe, in Batman Bat... No, it wasn't Batman Bad Blood. No, it was Justice League War. They inter- Oh, shit, my phone's at 15%. Yeah. yeah, but they introduce him in Justice League War, but they finally bring him back and introduce him as Steel in this movie, which he's totally badass. Then, of course, there was the last son of Krypton or the Eradicator. And then there's, of course, Cyborg Superman. And he's a really, really solid, threatening villain. Um, as, as I've said before, um, I think Cyborg Superman is one of the best villains in this whole series because he's pretty much an evil version of Superman. Aside from General Zod, the ultimate example of that is Cyborg Superman. Um, and also it was a really nice connection between having him be Hank Henshaw from the death of Superman and bring him back as the villain. Um, which again, I really do think these movies should be edited together as one whole movie. Uh, I think that's a big missed opportunity. But the biggest reason why Death of Superman is number one is just because the whole movie is just one big long action scene. Especially the actual fight between um, Superman and Doomsday. I don't like it quite as much as Superman versus Doomsday in Superman Doomsday. But this is a much better adaptation of that storyline. And in its own way, this one is really, really, really solid. It's more violent. It's more gritty. It's a bit more emotional. And it's also a bit longer, too. I think... There, it's like five or six minutes long. In Death of Superman, it's like ten minutes long, and it's fucking brutal. And how Superman kills Doomsday is freaking badass as shit. Twists Doomsday around by like a, a flying punch. Twists it all the way around. Crack. And I do like that uh, over the course of this fight, Doomsday just gets more and more and more monstrous looking. Uh, and it's badass as fuck um so yeah my number one favorite of this whole series is the death of superman this was the one that i went into figuring i think i'm gonna like this one and i was right i i dug the shit out of this one yeah i really wish they had been higher up and they they might go higher up the more i watch them especially since uh you know i've really become a big superman fan over the years um but yeah, anyway. So you can probably guess what my number one is. Nope. Because there's only one left. <laughs> Wonder Woman Bloodlines. Oh, okay. Duh. Yeah. And uh, the main reason, and I was shocked by this, whenever I was watching it, I was thinking, man, I really wish both of the live action movies had been this good or had engaged me as much as this movie did. It, I don't know, it's just the weirdest thing. I think I prefer the whole idea of Themyscira being discovered in the modern day more than in World War One or Two, which it usually it was is one. in the comics. Oh, yeah, it is, too, because Wonder Woman is very yeah. similar to Captain America in that sense. Yeah, that, and that's the reason why in the live-action movie they changed it is because they were trying to avoid the comparison. They still happened, unfortunately, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, no, watching Bloodlines, I was thinking almost kind of like the live-action Aquaman movie. Uh, Just in case you don't get the chance to do a sequel, fire all your bullets, as the great Zack Snyder once said. Uh, And I feel like this kind of puts almost all the really great Wonder Woman villains all together. I mean, some of them are kind of superfluous. And I do think... uh, Silver Swan was put in here because she kind of resembles uh, the golden armor suit that Wonder Woman wears in 84. Again, mm. 
to kind of tie in with uh, the movie as it came out in 2019, which was the original plan before it got delayed. Um, but no, yeah, I also really liked whenever, uh, you know, Wonder uh, Diana was uh, staying with uh, the archaeologist and the whole relationship she had with her daughter. See, I went into this not knowing that Silver Swan, <clears throat> excuse me, was going to be in it. So I was thinking, are they going to do uh, Cheetah? Because this, the animated version of Cheetah, at least in this universe, uh, she has red hair instead of blonde. And the girl, I can't remember her name, uh, Vanessa. Yeah, that Vanessa, was it. She, uh, yeah, Vanessa, she has red hair. And I was thinking, are they going to do, uh, is this going to be Cheetah? Of course it wasn't. And the main reason I was thinking that is because is because, spoiler alert, in Wonder Woman 84, uh, there is this kind of jealousy thing going on between uh, uh, Barbara and Diana. She envies uh, Diana and her, uh, well, her status as a as another woman. And uh, I, that kind of reminded me of what was going on with uh, uh, Vanessa's jealousy, how her mother was paying more attention to, to Diana and whatnot. And I was thinking... Man, this would have been a really good Cheetah origin story. Unfortunately, it wasn't, but Cheetah still showed up. And, uh, you know, that was cool. Uh, but really, what won, the, what won me over for this movie was the fact that Medusa was the... Now, if anybody doesn't know, I think I might have mentioned it in a review in the past. Uh, the original Clash of the Titans is my favorite movie of all time and one of the best scenes in that movie is, is the, the medusa, medusa scene. scene so that obviously yeah and it uh you know that left an indelible impression on me so anytime i see medusa in something i'm like oh cool there she is um and for one thing in this movie she's she grows to be pretty much kaiju sized mm -hmm. so i thought that was even better you know like it's just like this is like my dream uh, scenario for Wonder Woman to go up against something, and yeah, just all these various elements. There's there's a there's a Minotaur, a talking Minotaur, which should have been used a whole lot more. Oh yeah, a uh, that's a shame. They could have could have taken him along to Themyscira and uh, use him to take on like a grunt or something. But yeah, kind of a shame they never use him uh, after that funny knockoff Alfred Butler scene. Yeah, just just like the perfect, uh, like the perfect uh, sidekick character to bring along on like a mission or something. Mm -hmm. That's another one where I would be like, I mean, I would love to see him in live action. You know, stuff like basically every every almost this whole movie, I was thinking, man, I really wish this was the live action Wonder Woman movie. That's mainly the reason why it's it's at the top of my list is does it impress me so much. It's the one. It's the one of these animated movies where I'm like, yeah, I actually prefer this to uh, the DCU version. Not to say that the first Wonder Woman is bad, but I just prefer how this uh, did her origin story more. So yeah, that's why it's my number one. All right, well, I got to wrap this up. Trevor's about to die here, so. Uh, that's our ranking of the DC animated movie universe. I certainly had a lot of fun doing it. Go check out Trev's channel and check him out on the fictosphere.com. Um, look forward to future videos from us. Post your comments down below and let me know what you think. Hit the like button and hit the subscribe button and share this video with your friends. And as always, go out and watch some superhero movies. And I will see you guys in the next video.